Good morning, everybody. Uh, can I introduce uh, Professor Paul Taylor? He is the, uh, the government's chief scientific advisor to policing. Uh, professor Taylor um, is a professor at Lancaster University with a wealth of experience around uh, hostage negotiation, amongst other things, uh, for those of you in that world, and various other things that I will let Professor Taylor talk through. So uh, Professor Taylor will go through his uh, presentation and then there'll be we'll invite questions at the end uh, over to you professor he's not called me professor that much uh, last night um uh, uh, good morning everyone and particularly thank you to dave who's here for the second time and so we'll be laughing on cue to all of the jokes that you hear this, this morning um i suspect if i was talking to you uh, two years ago i'd probably have to say a little bit more about what a chief scientific advisor does um, because of COVID, uh, they've been very much in the public eye. So you probably have some intuitive idea of what a CSA for policing should be doing. But um, just to give you a, a sense of it, really my job is to uh, bring coherence to science and technology landscape and really help us as a community, and I mean as a community of everybody, make the most of the science and technology opportunities that exist both within policing and perhaps more importantly outside of policing which, on which we can uh, benefit. Uh, and really that's what I want to do today is to give you a understanding, a, a reflection of my first three months in office in terms of laying out the landscape, which is a very complex landscape, of the sorts of opportunities that are out there for us and how you might practically engage. And when I say you, I do mean everybody. So if you work in the front line, if you're a DDAT officer, if you're really into evidence-based policing, um, science and technology ought to be for everybody. Unfortunately, the landscape's of, uh, of the kind where it feels quite daunting to engage. And part of my role, if not one of the prime elements of my role, is really to try and soften that so that you feel you can uh, engage. I I'm a professor, and if you've met any professors, one thing you'll know about us is we're a fairly strange bunch. Um, while most of you probably had uh, posters of pop icons and football teams on your walls growing up, um, professors tend to have rather odd idols. And one of my idols was a chap called Louis Gutman, uh, who wrote a series of papers called What is Not What? And his argument was that actually one of the things you find within communities is that there's a tacit understanding of what is. And one of the things you have to do as an outsider is to, to point out that actually some of that's not true. So I thought I'd start off with my what is not what, which will either win the room or lose the room, and we'll find out. <laughs> the first thing to say is that policing S&T is not behind the curve vis-a-vis um, -vis other departments or industry. Yes, I was excited too when last month I moved on to Office 365. There are some elements where perhaps we could speed up a little bit, but there are other elements where actually policing is way ahead of the curve in terms of its innovation and its science use. I say that having worked in other sectors, uh, in defence and elsewhere, where clearly science and technology has a big role. It's really true. So, as a CSA, I can't have favourites, so I won't, for example, talk about Lancashire Voice, a project um, which on a very slow amount of, a very, a very small amount of money, took the 1.2 million 999 and 112 calls that Lancashire receives per year, uh, used some natural language processing so that they could identify the types of calls that they were getting, how they were being managed, what was falling through the gaps, and have revolutionised how they are now managing that call system from being able to say simply we get 1.2 million a year to the types of calls they get, how they're being routed, how they're being treated and so on off, off a really small innovative budget. I have seen similar systems in other sectors with very large budgets not achieve what they've achieved. So CSA can't have favourites so I won't mention to you then that Thames Valley Serious uh, uh, Violence Reduction Unit has managed to get into a data lake to a single system, um, data relevant to reducing violence uh, within their community from work and pensions, from schools, from, uh, well, they're going to get uh, um, NHS uh, and so on, and bringing that together to make some really important um, insertions in, into the prioritisations of, of preventative policing. I've seen that sort of effort where you bring together data from a variety of sources done in other areas with far less effect, with much higher budgets. So it is not the case that we're simply behind the curve. We're really, really good at some things, and it's my job to really push that forward. Uh, and where perhaps we need a bit of pulling, um, that's my job too. The second thing I really want to point out is that 
uh, uh, S&T is not simply for the scientist. S&T has to be for everybody in the policing community. And the reason for that is the most important person in any science enterprise, and I'll be talking about what that enterprise looks like in a bit, is the problem owner. It's the person who can tell me what problem it is to solve. Scientists are great at solving problems. We have the mechanisms to do so. It's really hard for us to know what the problem is. So actually in the whole scientific enterprise, and no offence to those of you who are specialists who work in the science domain, the one who I really want to talk to is that end user, the frontline person who has a problem, because once I identify that problem, we can do something about it. Uh, and the third thing I want to mention to you, um, just in case it hasn't come across your radar yet, is it is a really exciting time for science and technology and policing at the moment. Um, the Prime Minister has announced that the UK is going to be a science superpower, with good reason, given our, our pedigree and our history in that area. Policing has a really important role to play in that venture, and I'm going to try and speak to some of those in the future, uh, in the future slides. So it's a really great opportunity to be part of that great science power debate. Okay, so that's what the what is not what. And the opportunity then is that we really try and use science to create, to uh, access, to deploy and to share technology. And there's a variety of reasons we want to do so. To sustain capability. Um, let's face it, our, our, our SOC gangs are using technology to simply be able to keep pace with those we need to, to do this. To sustain and attract talent as we begin to uh, have more graduates come through into forces, those graduates will have expectations and desires to engage in science and technology, to drive efficiency. Uh, one of the things that's in uh, my portfolio is uh, the national AI, artificial intelligence strategy. And you can imagine there's lots of exciting conversations about what AI may or may not do. But the reality is for me, AI is going to be most useful in automation in driving efficiency. So that rather than having people handwrite in triplicate forms, we actually automate those. That's where the drive of AI, some of this fancy stuff that you hear about what AI can do, I don't actually think it's as interesting as some of the core efficiency drives you can get from it. And ultimately, it's just to, to stay, to get and stay one step ahead. Now, this isn't to suggest that we all should have one single model of S&T. Every force will have its own way of doing things, and that's really important. But we should be able to open up uh, the opportunities to everybody so that they can take advantage of them how they want to do so. OK, so how do we achieve this advantage? Should, what you're seeing here is a, a set of slides I've presented to Chiefs Council to really give people a sense of what it is to do science and technology and policing. Uh, and it's important to kind of represent this because I think sometimes people feel that it's something that's done or not done. And that's really not what the science enterprise is about. There are stages to science and it's important that we recognise them. At the most fundamental level, we've got underpinning research. So this is fundamental work that drives the next generation of what will be available to us often delivered by universities, though not solely, um, really focusing on the tomorrow's problems uh, and what we, what we might be able to achieve uh, down the line. Then uh, coming slightly closer to near time is understanding. So this is where we take what's available and we say, OK, what is going to be relevant for policing? Relevant policing in terms of how could we, what might go into in investigative and operational practice, but also what's relevant in terms of what are the future threats that we're likely to face and what do we need to do now to prepare for them. As we come slightly uh, even further towards near time, um, we engage in what I would call shaping research. So fundamental research tends not to be designed for the policing context. So shaping research takes that fundamental uh, S&T, says, what can we do with it within policing? And what do we need to do to stress test that uh, to get it forward? And then exploitation is where we principally sit in policing, where we take uh, available technology and we apply it. We principally sit there, but actually in order for us to really drive forward the forces, we need to do all of this system. But we can't do it alone. And there are important points to point out in this system. I've seen a number of occasions where People are taking uh, university research, great underpinning research, and getting rather frustrated that they can't exploit it three months later. 
There's a reason for that. It's got to go through that curve. Equally, the more we can give our requirements down this chain so that it comes down to there, and the cameraman told me not to stand in front of the slide, so I'll stand back over here. Uh, the more we can get our requirements down there, the faster things can move up that chain because they're already designed to be relevant um, for policing. So what are some of the opportunities? How are we going to fill each of those cogs? So let's start with underpin. There is a, a mass of research uh, funding out there which I don't believe we in policing take advantage of as much as we could do. Let me give you some examples. There is a current live EC funding stream which is giving away 860 million euros for policing and security issues. Many of them on fairly spiky topics which will be your day jobs. Um, so what's really interesting about the EC funding is that you have to have an end user as one of your partners when you're applying for this funding. Typically funding is worth three to 10 million euros. We are in policing an ideal end partner because we're willing to trial things. We've got the experience of what's going to work and what doesn't work. And so for that reason, Sean Mallison is now our nominated point of contact for those people in forces who perhaps have started working with a university or started working with an SME or an industry partner, or indeed just think that they've got a great idea which would answer one of the EC challenges and we could start hooking people up. The Prime Minister put three billion pounds into the EC funding so that the UK could continue to access it and his very fair challenge was that that three billion should come back into the country. It's a great opportunity for us to engage uh, as that end user in those projects. The same goes with uh, UKRI engagement. So UKRI has £14.9 billion in its portfolio for this year. I would like to see some of that come to policing. I'm not suggesting that we drive it all forward, but we work with industry and we work with academia to, to solve some of those problems. Even a, a slice of that money um, would be great. Uh, and of course, I'm there as, uh, as CSA in our small office to really support bids and help people through what might be quite an alien process to help you do that, including write, writing letters of support, which are often needed uh, in these bids. I think the final thing that's worth noting is we're currently um, in the early stages of putting together the National Science and Technology Strategy. Um, I hope I've got across to you, and I'll say it again, that I'm keen that s and strategy represents everybody's views and really the challenges that are going on at the front line of policing. So please do use the opportunities that will become available in the next couple of months to feed in your, uh, your ideas, your requirements, the challenges that you're facing. Because what comes out of this s and strategy is what's known as the document of the ARI document, the Areas of Research Interest document. That every CSA owns and effectively it's a to-do list. These are the things that we need solving in order to give more efficient and more effective policing and we take that ARI list to anybody who will listen so it helps industry build their products so that they're relevant for policing. It helps academia do fundamental research that in time may be relevant for policing. So it's a really important document to engage with and it helps us understand what the direction of travel will be. And so each of our capabilities, be it dogs, be it forensics, each has a kind of roadmap which maps out those key um, uh, challenges and how we're going to achieve them so that we have a better understanding of what is and what isn't possible. So that's under PIM. The next one is understand. So this is really what can we take from that broad ecosystem of science uh, and use it effectively. So you'll know that uh, together with the college, we engage in a set of futures mapping. Um, you'll, I hope some of you are a part of the innovation network um, that is run um, by the college across every force. That's something that we are seeking to invigorate. We engage importantly with um, some of our colleagues in national security and in defence, where they obviously have technologies that could be of value to us, making sure that we don't reinvent the wheel, but we actually borrow from them. It's an important aspect. We have just appointed the chair of uh, a scientific advisory council. The SAC uh, is a great place to go for those of you who are um, perhaps responsible for S&T strategy or are delivering a 
particular piece of technology and would like genuine, independent, constructive feedback. Uh, it's, it's a panel of the great and the good uh, who are networked really widely. A uh, great opportunity to go in, um, present your challenges and ask them to come back three months later with a different perspective and a different viewpoint, having spoken to the leaders in industry, in academia and in the charity sector. Uh, and then um, the final thing to note on the understanding piece is this is where the futures programmes that the chiefs have um, uh, developed really chimes in. So for those who don't know, uh, at Chiefs Council, um, the chiefs signed off a 2040 vision of where we'd want science to be uh, in my five main areas of science. And so where my understanding of it currently is we have these kind of large ticket items over here. We probably know about 50% of what we're doing currently, and part of my job is to get some of those lights from underneath the bushels. But really, the S&T strategy takes how we're going to get from here to there, and what that looks like, what does two years success look like, what does five years success look like, uh, and so on, so that we can begin to understand how successful we're being. So that's understanding. Then we get into the more meat, the things that you'll see more regularly, and that's shaping. What do we, how do we get to the point where we can uh, actually shape activity. Who here has heard of star funding? Well, it was more than yesterday, that's fantastic. So star funding is now in its third iteration, and when I joined on the 1st of May, um, I had to get it out of the door, so to speak, within the first couple of weeks, because it's uh, uh, funding that's restricted to the financial year. STAR stands for Science, Technology, Analysis and Research. It's funding principally to help forces innovate. Others in the room may know more than me, but it strikes me that the first two rounds of funding really didn't hit the police front line as much as it should do. And I tried really hard on this occasion to get that funding out to the, to the police line. In future years, please, this is for everybody, if you're interested in doing a piece of innovation, look out for it as we get to the early 2022. Um, it's a fund that really helps us shape uh, and exploit technology in a whole range of disciplines. It's competitive. So uh, if I took all of those proposals that were rated as good or above by our panel of academic, police and Home Office colleagues, then we would have needed a budget of 22 million. So there is some, that's how I know, that's why I could say at the beginning, there's some brilliant innovation out there because I've seen it written on paper. So part of my job is to try and up that funding, but that funding is there and I'd really encourage you to, to draw on it. Um, equally, I encourage you to reach out to Brendan Gilmore, happy to provide contact details for the Home Office Commissioning Hub. That is another way in which we are able to get our science funded, particularly uh, work that needs to be done in order for you to say operationally compliant or investigatively useful and so on. That's another route in. Another route, uh, particularly those in the data world, I'd encourage you to engage in if you haven't already, is the Home Office uh, 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 impact, uh, ACE, uh, Accelerated Capability Environment, in particular their impact labs. So what ACE does is do what they call sprints. So they'll take a particular problem set, they'll get a relevant set of people in the room and they'll drive it forward over a 10 week period really quickly. The most recent impact lab was run with Merseyside. Uh, uh, Merseyside took the data that they um, had around the Encro chat uh, investigation. Probably many of you know the Encro chat. This was a kind of a WhatsApp equivalent, which uh, we had the back door to, so we had all of the data. Uh, and um, uh, I always like the cheese guy story, if any of you ever saw this. So uh, the, the gentleman who took a photo of himself um, buying a piece of Stilton cheese and some red wine, put it on Encro chat to celebrate the fact that he was going to have a nice night in. But of course, cameras on the back of phones now are so powerful, they managed to get the fingerprint off the photograph. Um, so uh, anyway, so we got, uh, so Mer Merseyside have been working that data and making arrests over a period of around six months. They've got to the stage now where they thought, actually, we need to open this up and see what industry and academia can do with that data. We run an impact lab. We provide it to a select group of suppliers who, uh, it was slightly anonymised data anyway, but they certainly, they, they, they sign um, uh, memorandums of understanding. And then we let them go away and see what they can do with the data. And of course, what comes back Back as a set of great capabilities that we didn't have before and when, which is really useful. So impact labs, if there's a particular challenge in your force, are a, gr a great way of driving it forward. 
It's also worth noting um, that a, part, a parcel of this, I'm talking a lot about technology, but part and parcel, of course, of good S&T is people. <laughs> it's about engaging, it's about education as well. Uh, and heads of profession of capabilities are something that we're interested in. And actually, my office also is engaging with Universities UK. So that particularly for master's levels courses, let's say in digital forensics, what is it we need our digital forensics folks to know? Where are our gaps? Why are our next generation worries in terms of not having the relevant staffing? And what can we do to encourage universities to put on courses that f- will fill that gap? Yes, not tomorrow. I'm not going to relieve your, your personnel challenges tomorrow, but in three to five years' time, we'll have a much better throughput of people who've got the skill sets that you need. So again, if, there, if that's a challenge in your area where you're finding that the officers you're getting don't have that skill set, it's worth feeding that back because we can tell the universities that because ultimately universities will only put on courses that they think you need. It's up to us to tell them what we need and what the demand signal will look like. Uh, And just lastly, uh, exploit. So really at the sharp end, how do we uh, ensure that S&T is exploitable? Well, the first thing to say is... um, and this is going to sound slightly like the fourth emergency service, but one of the things that um, as a CSA I have is access to a very large pool of other CSAs uh, and their networks of experts and my own network of experts uh, in disciplines and sub-disciplines and sub-sub-sub-sub-disciplines of people who've spent their entire life doing one very particular thing. So if you need an academic expert uh, in a particular area, it's worth reaching out to that office. Um, Some of those are DV'd as well. So if it's uh, um, something which is sensitive, we can, again, put you in contact with the right person. The other thing that we're trying to do is succumbents and fellowships, and we're nearly about to announce an opportunity. And I see this as a two-way street. Firstly, I'd like to get uh, key researchers from industry and academia to sit alongside you in forces, because then they'll begin to understand the real challenges that you have and, how, and, and the barriers that uh, stop s and uh, achieving its effectiveness. And they will take that knowledge and understanding back to where they go. And, and while they're sat with you, of course, they'll solve a problem that's relevant to you. But also, I've had great experience in my past role of having officers seconded out into university settings for a period of time to do some deep work. For example, developing a national policy paper or um, building a strategy for a new department they've been asked to run. So I think that's a great way of creating this larger ecosystem or community of police uh, scientists uh, in that area. Um, We'll also be setting up soon science.police.uk. If nothing else, try and remember that address. Frankly, the very simple purpose of science.police.uk is to put all of the things that are going on in one place. So I was asked yesterday, for example, uh, um, by somebody uh, uh, who... Um, is involved in DDAT data. Um, you know, I just want to create an informal network of folk who are interested in data so that we can talk about it on a monthly basis. I know of at least eight such networks going on nationally, but, I don't, uh, but he didn't, of course, because that news just doesn't get out there. So um, it sounds very trivial, but simply science.police.uk um, as a way to, to bring together folks. And the last thing I'd encourage you to do um, is to, to, to look in your local regions at some of the centres of excellence that you'll find in universities. Um, increasingly, universities are putting in place centres which kind of sit between operational practice and research. So I came from one known as Centre of Research and Evidence of Security Threats, which was UKIC-funded centre. Uh, and our role, in a nutshell, I mean, we did many things, was really to try and help operational folk have the evidence, to drive through that evidence. Uh, uh, Those centres are getting lots of investment, but they're only as good as the stakeholders, yourselves, uh, they're only as good as the the information they get from stakeholders such as yourself. They need to know what you need in order to be effective. So we've talked through, that's the route through, and what I've tried to do is give you some ways into what is clearly a complex landscape um, so that you can feed forward your challenges, your problems, 
Um, and indeed, um, if you're in a position to do so, start taking on projects and securing some of this funding uh, to drive forward your own initiatives. Um, I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions. I'm interested both on your own reflections of what the challenges and opportunities are in science and technology uh, uh, and other issues that you might see going forward. Thanks very much. Yes, sir, at the back. Um, that's a brilliant long-term and kind of quite visionary talk, so thank you very much. Um, so my question is obviously a forthcoming spending review, and I suspect it's going to be one of a successive number of uh, spending reviews. How do you see the impact of that coming to some of the ideas and some of the things you've spoken, uh, spoken about today? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, firstly, I think having a CSA is a great advantage to policing when it comes to a spending review. Uh, I mean, it, it is no secret that other CSAs in other departments do a lot of the strategic um, selling of what we're aiming for, if that makes sense. So to be able to say, to, uh, and uh, to kind of cohere and to bring together what the science landscape in policing looks like, what is the s and estate, where are the holes in the estate, and what do we need to fill them is a really important function of the central NPCC office. Um, I don't think it will be a secret to anyone that certainly for the next spending review we're not going to see huge floods of cash, which is why you will have seen on many of my recommendations in terms of how we drive forward S&T is around working with others. Um, you know, there are other partners here who are increasingly in their own... So let's take UKRI as a great example. UKRI has a very large budget. Um, they are increasingly being asked um, to make sure that the research that they fund has impact and has relevance to society and to, to folks. Um, so they look to us. You know, we are, it's a great synergy for us that we can then say to them, well, actually, we can provide that. If, you, uh, if you're happy to ensure that some of the funding goes to policing projects, we can then demonstrate on the ground the impact that some of that science has. So, so the answer to the SR is, yes, of course, we will bang the drum um, um, and more strategically and more coherently put forward the case of what's missing and what's, what the opportunities are for uh, S&T. But then related to that, I think we need to sell a strong not sell, I think we need to act in a strong way to, to, as a cl collaborative community. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just interested in how you might help with a bit of deconfliction. So I'm uh, running a programme which is seeking to bring together uh, data, intelligence, analytics for policing onto a single cloud platform. Okay. Uh, okay. Whilst Sounds already easy. in collaboration yeah. with NCA, Brendan uh, has provided funding and resources from DSTL. Yes. Uh, lots of different Home Office departments. Um, within policing and within Home Office departments, we trip over each other because we sometimes have a wealth of riches in terms of the ideas, but because of separate governance arrangements and separate funding streams, we've mentioned lots which I've yeah, tied yeah, into yeah. over the last two years, um, we kind of don't have a, a central authority in terms of deciding which should be supported which, and which not. Yeah. So I spend a lot of my time having deconfliction discussions with colleagues um, and then working out a strategy that would um, uh, see us sort of bring, bring to the forefront uh, opportunities of collaboration rather than what could be seen as duplication and repeated funding. So just in terms of your role particularly, but also your networks, how, how you might yeah, help so, so the digital space is particularly uh, crowded and particularly... Um, so uh, there is no simple solution, as you would anticipate. What I've been trying to do with Chris Todd and others is, is to... Uh, to, to encourage some kind of networked structure. Um, in other domains, and other capabilities, it's much easier. So we've been able to put together two-page roadmaps for dogs, for example, and then we share it around the community. Uh, and now we have a set of challenges that we feel are the key challenges. In data, it's going to take a lot more, uh, I was going to say cohering of cats, but that's probably not a polite way of putting it, but um, uh, uh, of bringing folk together. It's beginning to crystallise, so I don't know if you were at the West Mids meeting uh, about a month ago, if you were, oh you were, okay, so, so I'm hoping those four working groups will begin to give some structure to it. It could be, and you, and you might have this in the back of your mind, that in a month's time those collapse and, and therefore it doesn't work at all. And, uh, uh, it's kind of my job to insist politely that a structure is taken. There will be no ideal structure, particularly in the data world, because it's such a complex landscape. But we have to have a structure, and then some things 
that fall through the gaps, we need to find ways to bring them back in. Um, and, it, and it has to be a community effort. You know, I think it has, um, I, what I was trying to get at with the four working groups was it needs to have everybody owning one of those so that people feel that they've got a way to dock in. Yeah. Oh, is it this afternoon? Okay, great. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'll grab you in a break. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. Hi. Um, so, I'm kind of um, leading the Optala recovery program. So, we've got okay. yeah. um, some work with our UKRI <laughs> funding with UCL. Great. So, um, Jill Dando, Dorps Centre for Policing. Um, but it would be great to link in with you just to see, you know, your views on that and how, when it's done, you're talking about the shaping. Obviously, we'll be sharing that, um, you know, paper and practice yeah. with forces around the recovery. And it's also got a future look around as well around sort of the civil contingencies and preparedness um, aspect as well. But you mentioned there the science.uk um, website for sharing. So yeah, is it? So, um, so you're right. Um, uh, I kind of have several things to say about that. Um, firstly, um, we are trying to think of a way that we can produce, I don't know if it's a newsletter or a set of two pages that provide much easier access to all of that material. Um, and that would be a classic example where we'd encourage uh, people who've collaborated with the universities to send over the big project report which can be, uh, JDI tends to be pretty good at doing pithy things other universities tend to uh, measure by the weight of the report um, <laughs> uh, you know, to, to, to pull out the, the meat of that and uh, in my last role I actually appointed what we called research to practice fellows, so one was an ex-officer uh, uh, who kind of understood both sides of the equation, their job was to kind of pull out the things that were relevant and put them in small reports. So that's something that's quite useful. And the other thing I was going to say is more broadly on that UKRIP, so I'm working with them and they've given me the back catalogue. So I asked them to go away and for the last five years, anything that had anything to do with policing, they've given me all the projects they've funded. And we've agreed to have a series of meetings um, around different priorities, so violence against women and girls, uh, frontline policing and so on, where the relevant projects come back. We get some of the relevant folks like yourselves in the room and we just explore whether or not some of those projects could have actually had more impact than they did. Because historically, I mean, they've funded a lot of work. And I, I, my, my instinct is, if I'm honest, about 40-50% of it is probably a bit too far away from us to ever have relevance. But there'll be other folks there where we could so, so I think there needs to be broader initiatives as well as this kind of one-to-ones, um, which we're talking about, if that makes sense. Yeah. Folks, we've run out of time, sorry. Uh, well, we'll pause around a bit, a bit longer, Jason. So can we just show our appreciation? Thanks very much. Applause?